Penguin Island by Anatole France. Book Seven. Modern Times. Madame Serret. Book Seven, Chapter One. Madame Clarence's Drawing Room. The chapter begins with a quote. Ahem. <clears throat> Only extreme things are tolerable. Count Robert de Montesquieu. Madame Clarence, the widow of an exalted functionary of the Republic, loved to entertain. Every Thursday she collected together some friends of modest condition who took pleasure in conversation. The ladies who went to see her, very different in age and rank, were all without money, and all had suffered much. There was a duchess who looked like a fortune-teller, and a fortune-teller who looked like a duchess. Madame Clarence was pretty enough to maintain some old liaisons, but not to form new ones, and she generally inspired a quiet esteem. She had a very pretty daughter, who, since she had no dower, caused some alarm among the male guests, for the penguins were as much afraid of portionless girls as they were of the devil himself. Eveline Clarence, noticing their reserve and perceiving its cause, used to hand them their tea with an air of disdain. Moreover, she seldom appeared at the parties and talked only to the ladies or the very young people. Her discreet and retiring presence put no restraint upon the conversation, since those who took part in it thought either that as she was a young girl she would not understand it, or that, being twenty-five years old, she might listen to everything. One Thursday, therefore, in Madame Clarence's drawing-room, the conversation turned upon love. The ladies spoke of it with pride, delicacy, and mystery, the men with discretion and fatuity. Everyone took an interest in the conversation, for each one was interested in what he or she said. A great deal of wit flowed, brilliant apostrophes were launched forth, and keen repartees were returned. But when Professor Haddock began to speak, he overwhelmed everybody. It is the same with our ideas on love as with our ideas on everything else, said he. They rest upon anterior habits whose very memory has been effaced. In morals, the limitations that have lost their grounds for existing, the, the most useless obligations, the cruelest and most injurious restraints, are because of their profound antiquity and the mystery of their origin, the least disputed and the least disputable as well as the most respected, and they are those that cannot be violated without incurring the most severe blame. All morality relative to the relations of the sexes is founded on this principle, that a woman, once obtained, belongs to the man, that she is his property like his horse or his weapons, and this having ceased to be true, absurdities result from it such as the marriage or contract or sale of a woman to a man, with clauses restricting the right of ownership, introduced as a consequence of the gradual diminution of the claims of the possessor. The obligation imposed on a girl that she should bring her virginity to her husband comes from the times when girls were married immediately they were of a marriageable age. It is ridiculous that a girl who marries at twenty-five or thirty should be subject to that obligation. You will perhaps say that it is a present with which her husband, if she gets one at last, will be gratified, but every moment we see men wooing married women and showing themselves perfectly satisfied to take them as they find them. Still, even in our own day, the duty of girls is determined in religious morality by the old belief that God, the most powerful of warriors, is polygamous, that he has reserved all maidens for himself, and that men can only take those whom he has left. This belief, although traces of it exist in several metaphors of mysticism, is abandoned today by most civilized peoples. However, it still dominates the education of girls not only among our believers but even among our free thinkers, who, as a rule, think freely for the reason that they do not think at all. Discretion means ability to separate and discern. We say that a girl is discreet when she knows nothing at all. We cultivate her ignorance. In spite of all our care, the most discreet know something, for we cannot conceal from them their own nature and their own sensations, but they know badly, they know in a wrong way. That is all we obtain by our careful education. Sir, suddenly said Joseph Boturel, the high treasurer of Alca, believe me, there are innocent girls, perfectly innocent girls, and it is a great pity. I have known three. They married, and the result was tragical. I have noticed, Professor Haddock went on, that Europeans in general, and penguins in particular, occupy themselves, 
after sport and motoring, with nothing so much as with love. It is giving a great deal of importance to a matter that has very little weight. Then, Professor, exclaimed Madame Cremure in a choking voice, when a woman has completely surrendered herself to you, you think it is a matter of no importance? No, Madame, it can have its importance, answered Professor Haddock. But it is necessary to examine if when she surrenders herself to us, she offers us a delicious fruit garden or a plot of thistles and dandelions. And then, do we not misuse words? In love, a woman lends herself rather than gives herself. Look at the pretty Madame Poncet. She is my mother, said a tall, fair young man. Sir, I have the greatest respect for her, replied Professor Haddock. Do not be afraid that I intend to say anything in the least offensive about her. But allow me to tell you that, as a rule, the opinions of sons about their mothers are not to be relied on. They do not bear enough in mind that a mother is a mother only because she loved and that she can still love. That, however, is the case, and it would be deplorable were it otherwise. I have noticed, on the contrary, that daughters do not deceive themselves about their mother's faculty for loving, or about the use they make of it. They are rivals. They have their eyes upon them. The insupportable professor spoke a great deal longer, adding indecorum to awkwardness, and impertinence to incivility, accumulating incongruities, despising what is respectable, respecting what is despicable, but no one listened to him further. During this time in a room that was simple without grace, a room sad for the want of love, a room which, like all young girls' rooms, had something of the cold atmosphere of a place of waiting about it, Eveline Clarence turned over the pages of club annuals and prospectuses of charities in order to obtain from them some acquaintance with society. Being convinced that her mother, shut up in her own intellectual but poor world, could neither bring her out or push her into prominence, she decided that she herself would seek the best means of winning a husband. At once calm and obstinate, without dreams or illusions, and regarding marriage as but a ticket of admission or a passport, she kept before her mind a clear notion of the hazards, difficulties, and chances of her enterprise. She had the art of pleasing and a coldness of temperament that enabled her to turn it to its fullest advantage. Her weakness lay in the fact that she was dazzled by anything that had an aristocratic air. When she was alone with her mother, she said, Mama, we will go tomorrow to Father Douillard's retreat. End of Book 7, Chapter 1 Chapter 2 The Charity of St. Orborosia Every Friday evening at nine o'clock, the choicest of Alcan society assembled in the aristocratic church of St. Mail for the Reverend Father Douillard's retreat. Prince and Princess de Boseno, Viscount and Viscountess Olive, Monsieur and Madame Bigor, Monsieur and Madame de la Tremelle were never absent. The flower of the aristocracy might be seen there, and fair Jewish baronesses also adorned it by their presence, for the Jewish baronesses of Alca were Christians. This retreat, like all religious retreats, had for its object to procure for those living in the world opportunities for recollection so that they might think of their eternal salvation. It was also intended to draw down upon so many noble and illustrious families the benediction of Lady Orborosia, who loves the penguins. The Reverend Father Douillard strove for the completion of his task with a truly apostolical zeal. He hoped to restore the prerogatives of St. Orborosia as the patron saint of Penguinia, and to dedicate to her a monumental church on one of the hills that dominate the city. His efforts had been crowned with great success, and for the accomplishing of this national enterprise, he had already united more than a hundred thousand adherents and collected more than twenty millions of francs. It was in the choir of St. Mail that St. Orborosia's new shrine, shining with gold, sparkling with precious stones, and surrounded by tapers and flowers, had been erected. The following account may be read in the history of the miracles of the patron saint of Alca, by the Abbe Plantain. The ancient shrine had been melted down during the terror, and the precious relics of the saint thrown into a fire that had been lit on the Place de Greve. But a poor woman of great piety named Roquin went by night, at the peril of her life, to gather up the calcined bones and ashes of the blessed saint. She preserved them in a jam-pot, 
and when religion was again restored, brought them to the venerable curé of St. Mael's. The woman ended her days piously as a vendor of tapers and custodian of seats in the saint's chapel. It is certain that in the time of Father Duyard, although faith was declining, the cult of St. Orborosia, which for three hundred years had fallen under the criticism of Canon Princeto and the silence of the doctors of the Church, recovered and was surrounded with more pomp, more splendor, and more fervor than ever. The theologians did not now subtract a single iota from the legend. They held as certainly established all the facts related by Abbot Simplicissimus, and in particular declared on the testimony of that monk that the devil, assuming a monk's form, had carried off the saint to a cave, and had there striven with her until she overcame him. Neither place nor dates caused them any embarrassment. They paid no heed to exegesis, and took good care not to grant as much to science as Canon Prince To had formerly conceded. They knew too well whither that would lead. The church shone with lights and flowers. An operatic tenor sang the famous canticle of St. Orborosia. Virgin of paradise, come, come in the dusty night, and on us shed thy beams of light. Mademoiselle Clarence sat beside her mother and in front of Viscount Clena. She remained kneeling during a considerable time, for the attitude of prayer is natural to discreet virgins, and it shows off their figures. The Reverend Father Duyard ascended the pulpit. He was a powerful orator, and could at once melt, surprise, and rouse his hearers. Women complained only that he fulminated against vice with excessive harshness, and in crude terms that made them blush, but they liked him none the less for it. He treated in his sermon of the seventh trial of St. Orborosia, who was tempted by the dragon which she went forth to combat, but she did not yield, and she disarmed the monster. The orator demonstrated without difficulty that we also, by the aid of St. Orborosia, and strong in the virtue which she inspires, can in our turn overthrow the dragons that dart upon us and are waiting to devour us, the dragon of doubt, the dragon of impiety, the dragon of forgetfulness of religious duties. He proved that the charity of St. Orborosia was a work of social regeneration, and he concluded by an ardent appeal to the faithful to become instruments of the divine mercy. Eager upholders and supporters of the charity of St. Orborosia, and to furnish it with all the means which it required to take its flight and bear its salutary fruits. After the ceremony, the Reverend Father Duyard remained in the sacristy at the disposal of those of the faithful who desired information concerning the charity, or who wished to bring their contributions. Mademoiselle Clarence wished to speak to Father Duyard, so did Viscount Clena. The crowd was large and a queue was formed. By chance, Viscount Clena and Mademoiselle Clarence were side by side, and possibly they were squeezed a little closely to each other by the crowd. Eveline had noticed this fashionable young man, who was almost as well known as his father in the world of sport. Clena had noticed her, and as he thought her pretty, he bowed to her, then apologized and pretended to believe that he had been introduced to the ladies, but could not remember where. They pretended to believe it also. He presented himself the following week at Madame Clarence's, thinking that her house was a bit fast, a thing not likely to displease him, and when he saw Eveline again, he felt he had not been mistaken, and that she was an extremely pretty girl. Viscount Clena had the finest motor car in Europe. For three months he drove the Clarences every day over hills and plains, through woods and valleys. They visited famous sites and went over celebrated castles. He said to Eveline all that could be said, and did all that could be done to overcome her resistance. She did not conceal from him that she loved him, that she would always love him, and love no one but him. She remained grave and trembling by his side. To his devouring passion she opposed the invincible defense of a virtue conscious of its danger. At the end of three months, after having gone uphill and downhill, turned sharp corners and negotiated level crossings, and experienced innumerable breakdowns, he knew her as well as he knew the flywheel of his car, but not much better. He employed surprises, adventures, sudden stoppages in the depths of forests and before hotels, but he had advanced no farther. 
he said to himself that it was absurd. Then taking her again in his car, he set off at fifty miles an hour, quite prepared to upset her in a ditch or to smash himself and her against a tree. One day, having come to take her on some excursion, he found her more charming than ever, and more provoking. He darted upon her as a storm falls upon the reeds that border a lake. She bent with adorable weakness beneath the breath of the storm, and twenty times was almost carried away by its strength. But twenty times she arose, supple and bowing to the wind. After all these shocks one would have said that a light breeze had barely touched her charming stem. She smiled as if ready to be plucked by a bold hand. Then her unhappy aggressor, desperate, enraged, and three parts mad, fled so as not to kill her, mistook the door, and went into the bedroom of Madame Clarence, whom he found putting on her hat in front of a wardrobe, seized her, flung her on the bed, and possessed her before she knew what had happened. The same day, Eveline, who had been making inquiries, learned that Viscount Clena had nothing but debts, lived on money given him by an elderly lady, and promoted the sale of the latest models of a motor-car manufacturer. They separated with common accord, and Eveline began again disdainfully to serve tea to her mother's guests. End of Book 7 Chapter 2 Chapter 3 Hippolyte Serre In Madame Clarence's drawing-room the conversation turned upon love, and many charming things were said about it. Love is a sacrifice, sighed Madame Cremure. I agree with you, replied M. Bartoul, with animation. But Professor Haddock soon displayed his fastidious insolence. It seems to me, said he, that the Penguin ladies have made a great fuss since, through St. Mail's agency, they became viviparous. But there is nothing to be particularly proud of in that, for it is a state they share in common with cows and pigs, and even with orange and lemon trees for the seeds of these plants germinate in the pericarp. The self-importance which the penguin ladies give themselves does not go so far back as that, answered Monsieur Bautour. It dates from the day when the holy apostle gave them clothes. But this self-importance was long kept in restraint, and displayed itself fully only with increased luxury of dress, and in a small section of society. For go only two leagues from Alca into the country at harvest time and you will see whether women are over-precise or self-important. On that day, M. Hippolyte Serre paid his first call. He was a deputy of Alca, and one of the youngest members of the house. His father was said to have kept a dram shop, but he himself was a lawyer of robust physique, a good though prolix speaker, with a self-important air and a reputation for ability. M. Serre, said the mistress of the house, your constituency is one of the finest in Alca. And there are fresh improvements made in it every day, madame. Unfortunately, it is impossible to take a stroll through it any longer, said M. Bautour. Why? asked M. Serre. On account of the motors, of course. Do not give them a bad name, answered the deputy. They are our great national industry. I know. The penguins of today make me think of the ancient Egyptians. According to Clement of Alexandria, Taine tells us, though he misquotes the text, the Egyptians worshipped the crocodiles that devoured them. The penguins today worship the motors that crush them. Without a doubt, the future belongs to the metal beast. We are no more likely to go back to cabs than we are to go back to the diligence, and the long martyrdom of the horse will come to an end. The motor which the frenzied cupidity of manufacturers hurls like a juggernaut's car upon the bewildered people, and of which the idle and fashionable make a foolish though fatal elegance, will soon begin to perform its true function, and putting its strength at the service of the entire people will behave like a docile, toiling monster. But in order that the motor may cease to be injurious and become beneficent, we must build roads suited to its speed, roads which it cannot tear up with its ferocious tires and from which it will send no clouds of poisonous dust into human lungs. We ought not to allow slower vehicles or mere animals to go upon those roads, and we should establish garages upon them and footbridges over them, and so create order and harmony among the means of communication of the future. That is the wish of every good citizen. 
Madame Clarence led the conversation back to the improvements in M. Serret's constituency. M. Serret showed his enthusiasm for demolitions, tunnelings, constructions, reconstructions, and all other fruitful operations. We build today in an admirable style, said he. Everywhere majestic avenues are being reared. Was ever anything as fine as our arcaded bridges and our domed hotels? You are forgetting that big palace surmounted with an immense melon-shaped dome, grumbled M. Danisset, an old art amateur, in a voice of restrained rage. I am amazed at the degree of ugliness which a modern city can attain. Alca is becoming Americanized. Everywhere we are destroying that charming object, a piece of an old wall that bears up the branches of a tree. Everywhere we are suppressing some fragment of light and air, some fragment of nature, some fragment of the associations that still remain with us, some fragment of our fathers, some fragment of ourselves. And we are putting up frightful, enormous, infamous houses, surmounted in Viennese style by ridiculous domes, or fashioned after the models of the new art, without mouldings or having profiles with sinister corbels and burlesque pinnacles, and such monsters as these shamelessly peer over the surrounding buildings. We see bulbous protuberances stuck out on the fronts of buildings, and we are told that they are new art motifs. I have seen the new art in other countries, but it is not so ugly as with us. It has fancy, and it has simplicity. It is only in our own country that by a sad privilege we may behold the newest and most diverse styles of architectural ugliness. Not an enviable privilege. Are you not afraid? asked M. Serret severely. Are you not afraid that these bitter criticisms tend to keep out of our capital the foreigners who flow into it from all parts of the world, and who leave millions behind them? You may set your mind at rest about that, answered M. Danisset. Foreigners do not come to admire our buildings. They come to see our courtesans, our dressmakers, and our dancing saloons. We have one bad habit, sighed M. Serret. It is that we calumniate ourselves. Madame Clarence, as an accomplished hostess, thought it was time to return to the subject of love, and asked M. Jumel his opinion of M. Leon Blum's recent book, in which the author complained that an irrational custom, went on Professor Haddock, prevents respectable young ladies from making love, a thing they would enjoy doing, whilst mercenary girls do it too much and without getting any enjoyment out of it. It is indeed deplorable. But M. Leon Blum need not fret too much. If the evil exists, as he says it does, in our middle-class society, I can assure him that everywhere else he would see a consoling spectacle. Among the people, the mass of the people throughout town and country, girls do not deny themselves that pleasure. It is depravity, said Madame Cremure, and she praised the innocence of young girls in terms full of modesty and grace. It was charming to hear her. Professor Haddock's views on the same subject were, on the contrary, painful to listen to. Respectable young girls, said he, are guarded and watched over. Besides, men do not, as a rule, pursue them much, either through probity or from a fear of grave responsibilities, or because the seduction of a young girl would not be to their credit. Even then we do not know what really takes place for the reason that what is hidden is not seen. This is a condition necessary to the existence of all society. The scruples of respectable young girls could be more easily overcome than those of married women if the same pressure were brought to bear on them, and for this there are two reasons. They have more illusions, and their curiosity has not been satisfied. Women, for the most part, have been so disappointed by their husbands that they have not courage enough to begin again with somebody else. I myself have been met by this obstacle several times in my attempts at seduction. At the moment when Professor Haddock ended his unpleasant remarks, Mademoiselle Eveline Clarence entered the drawing-room and listlessly handed about tea with that expression of boredom which gave an oriental charm to her beauty. For my part, said Hippolyte Serret, looking at her, I declare myself the young lady's champion. He must be a fool, thought the young girl. Hippolyte Serret, who had never set foot outside of his political world of electors and elected, thought Madame Clarence's drawing-room most select, its mistress exquisite, 
and her daughter amazingly beautiful. His visits became frequent, and he paid court to both of them. Madame Clarence, who now liked attention, thought him agreeable. Eveline showed no friendliness towards him, and treated him with a hauteur and disdain that he took for aristocratic behavior and fashionable manners, and he thought all the more of her on that account. This busy man taxed his ingenuity to please them, and he sometimes succeeded. He got them cards for fashionable functions and boxes at the opera. He furnished Mademoiselle Clarence with several opportunities of appearing to great advantage, and in particular at a garden party which, although given by a minister, was regarded as really fashionable, and gained its first success in society circles for the Republic. At that party Eveline had been much noticed, and had attracted the special attention of a young diplomat called Roger Lamberly, who, imagining that she belonged to a rather fast set, invited her to his bachelor's flat. She thought him handsome, and believed him rich, and she accepted. A little moved, almost disquieted, she very nearly became the victim of her daring, and only avoided defeat by an offensive measure audaciously carried out. This was the most foolish escapade in her unmarried life. Being now on friendly terms with ministers and with the President, Eveline continued to wear her aristocratic and pious affectations, and these won for her the sympathy of the chief personages in the anti-clerical and democratic republic. Monsieur Hippolyte Serret, seeing that she was succeeding and doing him credit, liked her still more. He even went so far as to fall madly in love with her. Henceforth, in spite of everything, she began to observe him with interest, being curious to see if his passion would increase. He appeared to her without elegance or grace, and not well-bred, but active, clear-sighted, full of resource, and not too great a bore. She still made fun of him, but he had now won her interest. One day she wished to test him. It was during the elections, when members of Parliament were, as the phrase runs, requesting a renewal of their mandates. He had an opponent who, though not dangerous at first and not much of an orator, was rich and was reported to be gaining votes every day. Hippolyta Serre, banishing both dull security and foolish alarm from his mind, redoubled his care. His chief method of action was by public meetings, at which he spoke vehemently against the rival candidate. His committee held huge meetings on Saturday evenings, and at three o'clock on Sunday afternoons. One Sunday, as he called on the Clarences, he found Eveline alone in the drawing-room, he had been chatting for about twenty or twenty-five minutes, when taking out his watch, he saw that it was a quarter to three. The young girl showed herself amiable, engaging, attractive, and full of promises. Saray was fascinated, but he stood up to go. "'Stay a little longer,' said she, in a pressing and agreeable voice which made him promptly sit down again. She was full of interest, of abandon, curiosity, and weakness. He blushed, turned pale, and again got up. Then, in order to keep him still longer, she looked at him out of two grey and melting eyes, and though her bosom was heaving, she did not say another word. He fell at her feet in distraction, but once more looking at his watch, he jumped up with a terrible oath. Damn! Quarter to four! I must be off! And immediately he rushed down the stairs. From that time onwards, she had a certain amount of esteem for him. End of Book 7 Chapter 3 Chapter 4. A Politician's Marriage She was not quite in love with him, but she wished him to be in love with her. She was, moreover, very reserved with him, and that not solely from any want of inclination to be otherwise, since in affairs of love some things are due to indifference, to inattention, to woman's instinct, to traditional custom and feeling, to a desire to try one's power, and to satisfaction at seeing its results. The reason of her prudence was that she knew him to be very much infatuated, and capable of taking advantage of any familiarity she allowed, as well as of reproaching her coarsely afterwards if she discontinued them. As he was a professed anti-clerical and free thinker, she thought it a good plan to affect an appearance of piety in his presence, and to be seen with prayer books bound in red morocco, such as Queen Marie Lazinska's or the Dauphiness Marie Josephine's The Last Two Weeks of Lent. She lost no opportunity either of showing him the subscriptions that she collected for the endowment of the national cult of St. Orborosia. Eveline did not act in this way because she wished to tease him, nor did it spring from a young girl's archness or a spirit of constraint 
or even from snobbishness, though there was more than a suspicion of this latter in her behavior. It was but her way of asserting herself, of stamping herself with a definite character, of increasing her value. To rouse the deputy's courage, she wrapped herself up in religion, just as Brunhild surrounded herself with flames so as to attract Sigurd. Her audacity was successful. He thought her still more beautiful thus. Clericalism was in his eyes a sign of good form. Saray was re-elected by an enormous majority and returned to a house which showed itself more inclined to the left, more advanced, and as it seemed more eager for reform than its predecessor. Perceiving at once that so much zeal was but intended to hide a fear of change and a sincere desire to do nothing, he determined to adopt a policy that would satisfy these aspirations. At the beginning of the session he made a great speech, cleverly thought out and well arranged, dealing with the idea that all reform ought to be put off for a long time. He showed himself heated, even fervid, holding the principle that an orator should recommend moderation with extreme vehemence. He was applauded by the entire assembly. The Clarences listened to him from the President's box, and Eveline trembled in spite of herself at the solemn sound of the applause. On the same bench the fair Madame Poncet shivered at the intonations of his virile voice. As soon as he descended from the tribune, Serret, even while the audience were still clapping, went without a moment's delay to salute the Clarences in their box. Eveline saw in him the beauty of success, and as he leaned towards the ladies, wiping his neck with his handkerchief, and receiving their congratulations with an air of modesty, though not without a tinge of self-conceit, the young girl glanced toward Madame Poncet and saw her palpitating and breathless, drinking in the hero's applause with her head thrown backwards. It seemed as if she were on the point of fainting. Eveline immediately smiled tenderly on Monsieur Serret. The Alcan deputy's speech had a great vogue. In political spheres it was regarded as extremely able. We have at last heard an honest pronouncement, said the chief moderate journal. It is a regular program, they said in the house. It was agreed that he was a man of immense talent. Hippolyte Serret had now established himself as leader of the radicals, socialists, and anti-clericals, and they appointed him president of their group, which was then the most considerable in the house. He thus found himself marked out for office in the next ministerial combination. After a long hesitation, Eveline Clarence accepted the idea of marrying Monsieur Hippolyte Serret. The great man was a little common for her taste. Nothing had yet proved that he would one day reach the point where politics bring in large sums of money, but she was entering her twenty-seventh year, and knew enough of life to see that she must not be too fastidious or show herself too difficult to please. Hippolyte Serret was celebrated. Hippolyte Serret was happy. He was no longer recognizable. The elegance of his clothes and deportment had increased tremendously. He wore an undue number of white gloves. Now that he was too much of a society man, Eveline began to doubt if it was not worse than being too little of one. Madame Clarence regarded the engagement with favor. She was reassured concerning her daughter's future and pleased to have flowers given her every Thursday for her drawing room. The celebration of the marriage raised some difficulties. Eveline was pious and wished to receive the benediction of the church. Hippolyte Serret, tolerant but a free thinker, wanted only a civil marriage. There were many discussions and even some violent scenes upon the subject. The last took place in the young girl's room at the moment when the invitations were being written. Eveline declared that if she did not go to church she would not believe herself married. She spoke of breaking off the engagement and of going abroad with her mother or of retiring into a convent. Then she became tender, weak, suppliant. She sighed, and everything in her virginal chamber sighed in chorus. The holy water fond, the palm branch above her white bed, the books of devotion on their little shelves, and the blue and white statuette of St. Orborosia chaining the dragon of Cappadocia that stood upon the marble mantelpiece. Hippolyte Serret was moved, softened, melted. Beautiful in her grief, her eyes shining with tears, her wrists girt by a rosary of lapis lazuli, and so to speak chained by her faith, she suddenly flung herself at Hippolyte's feet, and disheveled, almost dying, she embraced his knees. He nearly yielded. A religious marriage, he muttered. A marriage in church. 
I could make my constituents stand that, but my committee would not swallow the matter so easily. Still, I'll explain it to them. Toleration, social necessities. They all send their daughters to Sunday school. But as for office, my dear, I am afraid we are going to drown all hope of that in your holy water. At these words she stood up, grave, generous, resigned, conquered also in her turn. My dear, I insist no longer. Then we won't have a religious marriage. It will be better, much better not. Very well, but be guided by me. I am going to try and arrange everything both to your satisfaction and mine. She sought the Reverend Father Douillard and explained the situation. He showed himself even more accommodating and yielding than she had hoped. Your husband is an intelligent man, a man of order and reason. He will come over to us. You will sanctify him. It is not in vain that God has granted him the blessing of a Christian wife. The Church needs no pomp and ceremonial display for her benedictions. Now that she is persecuted, the shadow of the crypts and the recesses of the catacombs are in better accord with her festivals. Mademoiselle, when you have performed the civil formalities, come here to my private chapel in costume with Monsieur Serret. I will marry you and observe the most absolute discretion. I will obtain the necessary dispensations from the Archbishop, as well as all facilities regarding the bans, confession tickets, etc. Hippolyte, although he thought the combination a little dangerous, agreed to it, a good deal flattered at bottom. I will go in a short coat, he said. He went in a frock coat with white gloves and varnished shoes, and he genuflected. Politeness demands. End of Book 7, Chapter 4 Chapter 5 The Visere Cabinet The Surrey household was established with modest decency in a pretty flat situated in a new building. Surrey loved his wife in a calm and tranquil fashion. He was often kept late from home by the commission on the budget, and he worked more than three nights a week at a report on the postal finances of which he hoped to make a masterpiece. Eveline thought she could twist him round her finger, and this did not displease him. The bad side of their situation was that they had not much money. In truth, they had very little. The servants of the Republic do not grow rich in her service as easily as people think. Since the sovereign is no longer there to distribute favors, each of them takes what he can, and his depredations, limited by the depredations of all the others, are reduced to modest proportions. Hence that austerity of morals that is noticed in democratic leaders. They can only grow rich during periods of great business activity, and then they find themselves exposed to the envy of their less favored colleagues. Hippolyte Serre had for a long time foreseen such a period. He was one of those who had made preparations for its arrival. Whilst waiting for it, he endured his poverty with dignity, and Eveline shared that poverty without suffering as much as one might have thought. She was in close intimacy with the Reverend Father Douillard, and frequented the chapel of St. Orborosia, where she met with serious society and people in a position to render her useful services. She knew how to choose among them, and gave her confidence to none but those who deserved it. She had gained experience since her motor excursions with Viscount Clena, and above all, she had now acquired the value of a married woman. The deputy was at first uneasy about these pious practices, which were ridiculed by the demagogic newspapers. But he was soon reassured, for he saw all around him democratic leaders joyfully becoming reconciled to the aristocracy and the church. They found that they had reached one of those periods which often recur when advance had been carried a little too far. Hippolytus Serre gave a moderate support to this view. His policy was not a policy of persecution, but a policy of tolerance. He had laid its foundations in his splendid speech on the preparations for reform. The Prime Minister was looked upon as too advanced. He proposed schemes which were admitted to be dangerous to capital, and the great financial companies were opposed to him. Of course it followed that the papers, of all views, supported the companies. Seeing the danger increasing, the cabinet abandoned its schemes, its program, and its opinions, but it was too late. A new administration was already ready. An insidious question by Paul Visere, which was immediately made the subject of a resolution, and a fine speech by Hippolyte Serre overthrew the cabinet. 
the President of the Republic entrusted the formation of a new cabinet to this same Paul Visere, who, though still very young, had been a minister twice. He was a charming man, spending much of his time in the green rooms of theatres, very artistic, a great society man, of amazing ability and industry. Paul Visere formed a temporary ministry intended to reassure public feeling, which had taken alarm, and Hippolyte Serre was invited to hold office in it. The new ministry, belonging to all the groups in the majority, represented the most diverse and contrary opinions, but they were all moderate and convinced conservatives. The author interrupts at this point to say, as this ministry exercised considerable influence upon the destinies of the country and of the world, we think it well to give its composition. Minister of the Interior and Prime Minister, Paul Visere, Minister of Justice, Pierre Bou, Foreign Affairs, Victor Cromville, Finance, Terrasson, Education, La Villette, Commerce, Posts and Telegraphs, Hippolyte Serre, Agriculture, Olac, Public Works, La Personne, War, General de Bonaire, Admiralty, Admiral Vivier de Moraine. And then the author continues by saying, The Minister of Foreign Affairs was retained from the former cabinet, he was a dark little man called Cromville, who worked fourteen hours a day with the conviction that he dealt with tremendous questions. He refused to see even his own diplomatic agents, and was terribly uneasy, though he did not disturb anybody else, for the want of foresight of peoples is infinite, and that of governments is just as great. The office of public works was given to a socialist, Fortune La Personne. It was then a political custom, and one of the most solemn, most severe, most rigorous, and if I may dare say so, the most terrible and cruel of all political customs, to include a member of the Socialist Party in each ministry intended to oppose socialism, so that the enemies of wealth and property should suffer the shame of being attacked by one of their own party, and so that they could not unite against these forces without turning to someone who might possibly attack themselves in the future. Nothing but a profound ignorance of the human heart would permit the belief that it was difficult to find a socialist to occupy these functions. Citizen Fortune La Personne entered the Visere cabinet of his own free will and without any constraint, and he found those who approved of his action even among his former friends, so great was the fascination that power exercised over the penguins. General Debonair went to the war office. He was looked upon as one of the ablest generals in the army, but he was ruled by a woman, the Baroness Bilderman, who, though she had reached the age of intrigue, was still beautiful. She was in the pay of a neighboring and hostile power. The new minister of marine, the worthy Admiral Vivier de Moraine, was generally regarded as an excellent seaman. He displayed a piety that would have seemed excessive in an anti-clerical minister, if the Republic had not recognized that religion was of great maritime utility. Acting on the instruction of his spiritual director, the Reverend Father Douillard, the worthy admiral had dedicated his fleet to St. Orborosia, and directed canticles in honor of the Alcan Virgin to be composed by Christian bards. These replaced the national hymn in the music played by the navy. Prime Minister Visere declared himself to be distinctly anti-clerical, but ready to respect all creeds. He asserted that he was a sober-minded reformer. Paul Visere and his colleagues desired reforms, and it was in order not to compromise reform that they proposed none for they were true politicians and knew that reforms are compromised the moment they are proposed. The government was well received, respectable people were reassured, and the funds rose. The administration announced that four new ironclads would be put into commission, that prosecutions would be undertaken against the socialists, and it formally declared its intention to have nothing to do with any inquisitorial income tax. The choice of Terrasson as Minister of Finance was warmly approved by the press, Terrasson, an old minister famous for his financial operations, gave warrant to all the hopes of the financiers and shadowed forth a period of great business activity. Soon, those three udders of modern nations, monopolies, bill discounting, and fraudulent speculation were swollen with the milk of wealth. Already whispers were heard of distant enterprises and of planting colonies, and the boldest put forth in the newspapers the project of a military and financial protectorate over in Agricia. Without having yet shown what he was capable of, Hippolyte Serre was considered a man of weight. Business people thought highly of him. 
He was congratulated on all sides for having broken with the extreme sections, the dangerous men, and for having realized the responsibilities of government. Madame Serret shone alone amid the minister's wives. Crombile withered away in bachelordom. Paul Visere had married money in the person of Mademoiselle Blampignon, an accomplished, estimable, and simple lady who was always ill and whose feeble health compelled her to stay with her mother in the depths of a remote province. The other ministers' wives were not born to charm the sight, and people smiled when they read that Madame Labillette had appeared at the presidency ball, wearing a headdress of birds of paradise. Madame Vivier de Morin, a woman of good family, was stout rather than tall, had a face like a beefsteak, and the voice of a newspaper seller. Madame de Bonheur, tall, dry, and florid, was devoted to young officers. She ruined herself by her escapades and crimes, and only regained consideration by dint of ugliness and insolence. Madame Serret was the charm of the ministry, and its tied to consideration. Young, beautiful, and irreproachable, she charmed alike society and the masses by her combination of elegant costumes and pleasant smiles. Her receptions were thronged by the great Jewish financiers. She gave the most fashionable garden parties in the Republic. The newspapers described her dresses, and the milliners did not ask her to pay for them. She went to Mass, she protected the chapel of St. Orborosia from the ill will of the people, and she aroused in aristocratic hearts the hope of a fresh concordat. With her golden hair, gray eyes, and supple and slight though rounded figure, she was indeed pretty. She enjoyed an excellent reputation, and she was so adroit and calm, so much mistress of herself, that she would have preserved it intact even if she had been discovered in the very act of ruining it. The session ended with a victory for the cabinet, which, amid the almost unanimous applause of the House, defeated a proposal for an inquisitorial tax, and with a triumph for Madame Serret, who gave parties in honor of three kings who were at the moment passing through Alca. End of Book 7, Chapter 5 Chapter 6 The Sofa of the Favorite The Prime Minister invited Monsieur and Madame Serret to spend a couple of weeks of the holidays in a little villa that he had taken in the mountains, and in which he lived alone. The deplorable health of Madame Paul Visere did not allow her to accompany her husband, and she remained with her relatives in one of the southern provinces. The villa had belonged to the mistress of one of the last kings of Alca. The drawing-room retained its old furniture, and in it was still to be found the sofa of the favorite. The country was charming. A pretty blue stream, the Azelle, flowed at the foot of the hill that dominated the villa. Hippolyte Serre loved fishing. When engaged at this monotonous occupation, he often formed his best parliamentary combinations and his happiest oratorical inspirations. Trout swarmed in the Icel. He fished it from morning till evening in a boat that the Prime Minister readily placed at his disposal. In the meantime, Evelyn and Paul Visere sometimes took a turn together in the garden, or had a little chat in the drawing-room. Eveline, although she recognized the attraction that Visere had for women, had hitherto displayed towards him only an intermittent and superficial coquetry, without any deep intentions or settled design. He was a connoisseur and saw that she was pretty. The house and the opera had deprived him of all leisure, but in a little villa the gray eyes and rounded figure of Eveline took on a value in his eyes. One day, as Hippolyta Serret was fishing in the Iselle, he made her sit beside him on the sofa of the favorite. Long rays of gold struck Eveline like arrows from a hidden cupid through the chinks of the curtains which protected her from the heat and glare of a brilliant day. Beneath her white muslin dress, her rounded yet slender form was outlined in its grace and youth. Her skin was cool and fresh, and had the fragrance of freshly mown hay. Paul Visere behaved as the occasion warranted, and for her part she was opposed neither to the games of chance or of society. She believed it would be nothing or a trifle. She was mistaken. There was, says the famous German ballad, on the sunny side of the town square, beside a wall whereon the creeper grew, a pretty little letter-box, as blue as the cornflowers, smiling and tranquil. Ah! All day long there came to it, in their heavy shoes, 
small shopkeepers, rich farmers, citizens, the tax collector and the policeman, and they put into it their business letters, their invoices, their summonses, the notices to pay taxes, the judges' returns, and orders for the recruits to assemble. It remained smiling and tranquil, oh, with joy or in anxiety, there advanced towards it workmen and farm servants, maids and nursemaids, accountants, clerks, and women carrying their little children in their arms. They put into it notifications of births, marriages, and deaths, letters between engaged couples, between husbands and wives, from mothers to their sons, and from sons to their mothers. It remained smiling and tranquil. Oh, at twilight, Young lads and young girls slipped furtively to it and put in love letters, some moistened with tears that blotted the ink, others with a little circle to show the place to kiss, all of them very long. It remained smiling and tranquil. <coughs> Rich merchants came themselves through excess of carefulness at the hour of daybreak and put into it registered letters and letters with five red seals, full of banknotes or checks on the great financial establishments of the empire. It remained smiling and tranquil. Oh. But one day, Gaspar, whom it had never seen, and whom it did not know from Adam, came to put in a letter, of which nothing is known but that it was folded like a little hat. Immediately, the pretty letter-box fell into a swoon. Ah! Oh. Henceforth, it remains no longer in its place. It runs through streets, fields, and woods, girdled with ivy and crowned with roses. It keeps running uphill and down dale. The country policeman surprises it sometimes, amidst the corn, in Gaspar's arms, kissing him upon the mouth. Oh! Paul Visere had recovered all his customary nonchalance. Eveline remained stretched on the divan of the favorite in an attitude of delicious astonishment. The Reverend Father Douillard, an excellent moral theologian, and a man who in the decadence of the church has preserved his principles, was very right to teach, in conformity with the doctrine of the fathers, that while a woman commits a great sin by giving herself for money, she commits a much greater one by giving herself for nothing. For in the first case, she acts to support her life, and that is sometimes not merely excusable, but pardonable, and even worthy of the divine grace. For God forbids suicide, and is unwilling that his creatures should destroy themselves. Besides, in giving herself an order to live, she remains humble, and derives no pleasure from it, a thing which diminishes the sin. But a woman who gives herself for nothing sins with pleasure and exults in her fault. The pride and delight with which she burdens her crime increase its load of moral guilt. Madame Hippolyta Serre's example shows the profundity of these moral truths. She perceived that she had senses. A second was enough to bring about this discovery, to change her soul, to alter her whole life. To have learned to know herself was at first a delight. The Nothi Siotan, Know Thyself, of the ancient philosophy, is not a precept the moral fulfillment of which procures any pleasure, since one enjoys little satisfaction from knowing one's soul. It is not the same with the flesh, for in it sources of pleasure may be revealed to us. Eveline immediately felt an obligation to her revealer equal to the benefit she had received, and she imagined that he who had discovered these heavenly depths was the sole possessor of the key to them. Was this an error, and might she not be able to find others who also had the golden key? It is difficult to decide, and Professor Haddock, when the facts were divulged, which happened without much delay as we shall see, treated the matter from an experimental point of view, in a scientific review, and concluded that the chances Madame C. would have of finding the exact equivalent of Monsieur V. were in proportion of 305, to nine hundred and seventy-five thousand and eight. This is as much as to say that she would never find it. Doubtless her instinct told her the same, for she attached herself distractedly to him. 
I have related these facts with all the circumstances which seem to me worthy of attracting the attention of meditative and philosophic minds. The sofa of the favorite is worthy of the majesty of history. On it were decided the destinies of a great people. Nay, on it was accomplished an act whose renown was to extend over the neighboring nations both friendly and hostile, and even over all humanity. Too often events of this nature escape the superficial minds and shallow spirits who inconsiderately assume the task of writing history. Thus the secret springs of events remain hidden from us. The fall of empires and the transmission of dominions astonish us and remain incomprehensible to us because we have not discovered the imperceptible point or touched the secret spring which when put in movement has destroyed and overthrown everything. The author of this great history knows better than anyone else his faults and his weaknesses, but he can do himself this justice, that he has always kept the moderation, the seriousness, the austerity, which an account of affairs of state demands, and that he has never departed from the gravity which is suitable to a recital of human actions. End of Book 7, Chapter 6 Chapter 7 The First Consequences when Eveline confided to Paul Visire that she had never experienced anything similar, he did not believe her. He had had a good deal to do with women, and knew that they readily say these things to men in order to make them more in love with them. Thus his experience, as sometimes happens, made him disregard the truth. Incredulous but gratified all the same, he soon felt love and something more for her. This state at first seemed favorable to his intellectual faculties. Visere delivered in the chief town of his constituency a speech full of grace, brilliant and happy, which was considered to be a masterpiece. The reopening of Parliament was serene. A few isolated jealousies, a few timid ambitions raised their heads in the house, and that was all. A smile from the Prime Minister was enough to dissipate these shadows. She and he saw each other twice a day, and wrote to each other in the interval. He was accustomed to intimate relationships, was adroit, and knew how to dissimulate. But Eveline displayed a foolish imprudence. She made herself conspicuous with him in drawing-rooms, at the theatre, in the house, and at the embassies. She wore her love upon her face, upon her whole person, in her moist glances, in the languishing smile of her lips, in the heaving of her breast, in all her heightened, agitated, and distracted beauty. Soon the entire country knew of their intimacy. Foreign courts were informed of it. The President of the Republic and Eveline's husband alone remained in ignorance. The President became acquainted with it in the country through a misplaced police report which found its way, it is not known how, into his portmanteau. Hippolyte Serre, without being either very subtle or very perspicacious, noticed that there was something different in his home. Eveline, who quite lately had interested herself in his affairs, and shown, if not tenderness, at least affection towards him, displayed henceforth nothing but indifference and repulsion. She had always had periods of absence, and made prolonged visits to the charity of St. Orborosia. Now she went out in the morning, remained out all day, and sat down to dinner at nine o'clock in the evening, with the face of a somnambulist. Her husband thought it absurd. However, he might perhaps have never known the reason for this, a profound ignorance of women, a crass confidence in his own merit and in his own fortune, might perhaps have always hidden the truth from him if the two lovers had not, so to speak, compelled him to discover it. When Paul Visere went to Eveline's house and found her alone, they used to say as they embraced each other, Not, not here, not here. here, and immediately they affected an extreme reserve. That was their invariable rule. Now one day, Paul Visere went to the house of his colleague Serre, with whom he had an engagement. It was Eveline who received him, the Minister of Commerce being delayed by a commission. Not, Not here, here, said the lovers, smiling. They said it, mouth to mouth, embracing and clasping each other. They were still saying it when Hippolyte Serre entered the drawing-room. Paul Visere did not lose his presence of mind. He declared to Madame Serre that he would give up his attempt to take the dust out of her eye. By this attitude he did not deceive the husband, but he was able to leave the room with some dignity. Hippolyte Serre was thunderstruck. Eveline's conduct appeared incomprehensible to him. He asked her what reason she had for it. Why? Why? He kept repeating continually. 
Why? She denied everything, not to convince him, for he had seen them, but from expediency and good taste, and to avoid painful explanations. Hippolytus Serret suffered all the tortures of jealousy. He admitted it to himself. He kept saying inwardly, I am a strong man. I am clad in armor. But the wound is underneath. It is in my heart. And turning towards his wife, who looked beautiful in her guilt, he would say, It ought not to have been with him. He was right. Eveline ought not to have loved in government circles. He suffered so much that he took up his revolver, exclaiming, I will go and kill him. But he remembered that a minister of commerce cannot kill his own prime minister, and he put his revolver back into his drawer. The weeks passed without calming his sufferings. Each morning he buckled his strong man's armor over his wound and sought in work and fame the peace that fled from him. Every Sunday he inaugurated busts, statues, fountains, artesian wells, hospitals, dispensaries, railways, canals, public markets, drainage systems, triumphal arches, and slaughterhouses, and delivered moving speeches on each of these occasions. His fervid activity devoured whole piles of documents. He changed the colors of the postage stamps fourteen times in one week. Nevertheless, he gave vent to outbursts of grief and rage that drove him insane. For whole days his reason abandoned him. If he had been in the employment of a private administration, this would have been noticed immediately. But it is much more difficult to discover insanity or frenzy in the conduct of affairs of state. At that moment the government employees were forming themselves into associations and federations amid a ferment that was giving alarm both to the Parliament and to public feeling. The postmen were especially prominent in their enthusiasm for trade unions. Hippolytus Serre informed them in a circular that their action was strictly legal. The following day he sent out a second circular forbidding all associations of government employees as illegal. He dismissed 180 postmen, reinstated them, reprimanded them, and awarded them gratuities. At cabinet councils he was always on the point of bursting forth. The presence of the head of state scarcely restrained him within the limits of the decencies, and as he did not dare to attack his rival, he consoled himself by heaping invectives upon General Debonair, the respected minister of war. The general did not hear them, for he was deaf, and occupied himself in composing verses for the Baroness Bilderman. Hippolytus Serre offered an indistinct opposition to everything the prime minister proposed. In one word, he was a madman. One faculty alone escaped the ruin of his intellect. He retained his parliamentary sense, his consciousness of the temper of majorities, his thorough knowledge of groups, and his certainty of the direction in which affairs were moving. End of Book 7, Chapter 7 Chapter 8 Further Consequences The session ended calmly and the ministry saw no dangerous signs upon the benches where the majority sat. It was visible, however, from certain articles in the moderate journals, that the demands of the Jewish and Christian financiers were increasing daily, that the patriotism of the banks required a civilizing expedition to Negritia, and that the steel trusts, eager in the defense of our coasts and colonies, were crying out for armored cruisers and still more armored cruisers. Rumors of war began to be heard. Such rumors sprang up every year as regularly as the trade winds, serious people paid no heed to them, and the government usually let them die away from their own weakness, unless they grew stronger and spread, for in that case the country would be alarmed. The financiers only wanted colonial wars, and the people did not want any wars at all. It loved to see its government proud and even insolent, but at the least suspicion that a European war was brewing, its violent emotion would quickly have reached the house. Paul Visere was not uneasy. The European situation was, in his view, completely reassuring. He was only irritated by the maniacal silence of his Minister of Foreign Affairs. That gnome went to the cabinet meetings with a portfolio bigger than himself, stuffed full of papers, said nothing, refused to answer all questions, even those asked by the respected President of the Republic, and exhausted by his obstinate labors, took a few moments' sleep in his armchair in which nothing but the top of his little black head was to be seen above the green tablecloth. In the meantime, Hippolytus Serre became a strong man again. In company with his colleague La Persone, 
he formed numerous intimacies with ladies of the theatre. They were both to be seen at night, entering fashionable restaurants in the company of ladies, whom they overtopped by their lofty stature and their new hats, and they were soon reckoned among the most sympathetic frequenters of the boulevards. Fortune La Personne had his own wound beneath his armor. His wife, a young milliner whom he carried off from a marquis, had gone to live with a chauffeur. He loved her still and could not console himself for her loss, so that very often, in the private room of a restaurant, in the midst of a group of girls who laughed and ate crayfish, the two ministers exchanged a look full of their common sorrow and wiped away an unbidden tear. Hippolyte Serret, although wounded to the heart, did not allow himself to be beaten. He swore that he would be avenged. Madame Paul Visere, whose deplorable health forced her to live with her relatives in a distant province, received an anonymous letter specifying that Monsieur Paul Visere, who had not a halfpenny when he married her, was spending her dowry on a married woman, E. C., that he gave this woman thirty thousand franc motor cars and pearl necklaces costing twenty-five thousand francs, and that he was going straight to dishonor and ruin. Madame Paul Visere read the letter, fell into hysterics, and handed it to her father. I am going to box your husband's ears, said Monsieur Blampignon. He is a blackguard who will land you both in the workhouse unless we look out. He may be prime minister, but he won't frighten me. When he stepped off the train, Monsieur Blampignon presented himself at the Ministry of the Interior, and was immediately received. He entered the Prime Minister's room in a fury. I have something to say to you, sir, and he waved the anonymous letter. Paul Visere welcomed him, smiling. You are welcome, my dear father. I was going to write to you. Yes, to tell you of your nomination to the rank of officer of the Legion of Honor. I signed the patent this morning. M. Blampignon thanked his son-in-law warmly and threw the anonymous letter into the fire. He returned to his provincial house and found his daughter fretting and agitated. Well, I saw your husband. He is a delightful fellow. But then you don't understand how to deal with him. About this time Hippolyte Serre learned through a little scandalous newspaper, it is always through the newspapers that ministers are informed of the affairs of state, that the Prime Minister dined every evening with Mademoiselle Lysian of the Folie Dramatique, whose charm seemed to have made a great impression on him. Thenceforth, Serre took a gloomy joy in watching his wife. She came in every evening to dine or dress with an air of agreeable fatigue and the serenity that comes from enjoyment. Thinking that she knew nothing, he sent her anonymous communications. She read them at the table before him and remained still listless and smiling. He then persuaded himself that she gave no heed to these vague reports, and that in order to disturb her it would be necessary to enable her to verify her lover's infidelity and treason for herself. There were at the ministry a number of trustworthy agents charged with secret inquiries regarding the national defense. They were then employed in watching the spies of a neighboring and hostile power who had succeeded in entering the postal and telegraphic service. M. Serret ordered them to suspend their work for the present, and to inquire where, when, and how the Minister of the Interior saw Mademoiselle Lysion. The agents performed their missions faithfully, and told the Minister that they had several times seen the Prime Minister with a woman, but that she was not Mademoiselle Lysion. Hippolyte Serret asked them nothing further. He was right. The loves of Paul Visere and Lysion were but an alibi invented by Paul Visere himself with Eveline's approval, for his fame was rather inconvenient to her, and she sighed for secrecy and mystery. They were not shadowed by the agents of the Ministry of Commerce alone. They were also followed by those of the Prefect of Police, and even those of the Minister of the Interior, who disputed with each other the honor of protecting their chief. Then there were the emissaries of several royalist, imperialist, and clerical organizations, those of eight or ten blackmailers, several amateur detectives, a multitude of reporters, and a crowd of photographers, who all made their appearance wherever these two took refuge in their perambulating love affairs, at big hotels, small hotels, townhouses, country houses, private apartments, vias, museums, palaces, and hovels. They kept watch in the streets, from neighboring houses, trees, walls, staircases, landings, roofs, adjoining rooms, and even chimneys. The minister and his friend saw with alarm 
all round their bedroom, gimlets boring through doors and shutters, and drills making holes in the walls. A photograph of Madame Serret, in night attire, buttoning her boots, was the most that had been obtained. Paul Visere grew impatient and irritable, and often lost his good humor and agreeableness. He came to the cabinet meetings in a rage, and he too poured invectives upon General Debonair, a brave man under fire, but a lax disciplinarian, and launched his sarcasms against the venerable Admiral Vivier de Morin, whose ships went to the bottom without any apparent reason. Fortune La Personne listened open-eyed and grumbled scoffingly between his teeth. He is not satisfied with robbing Hippolyte Serre of his wife, but he must go and rob him of his catchwords, too? These storms were made known by the indiscretion of some ministers and by the complaints of the two old warriors, who declared their intention of flinging their portfolios at the beggar's head, but who did nothing of the sort. These outbursts, far from injuring the lucky Prime Minister, had an excellent effect on Parliament and public opinion, who looked on them as signs of a keen solicitude for the welfare of the National Army and Navy. The Prime Minister was the recipient of general approbation. To the congratulations of the various groups and of noble personages, he replied with simple firmness, Those are my principles, and he had seven or eight socialists put in prison. The session ended and Paul Visere, very exhausted, went to take the waters. Hippolytus Serre refused to leave his ministry, where the trade union of telephone girls was in tumultuous agitation. He opposed it with an unheard of violence, for he had now become a woman-hater. On Sundays he went into the suburbs to fish, along with his colleague La Parson, wearing the tall hat that had never left him since he had become a minister. And both of them, forgetting the fish, complained of the inconstancy of women, and mingled their griefs. Hippolytus still loved Eveline, and he still suffered. However, hope had slipped into his heart. She was now separated from her lover, and thinking to win her back, he directed all his efforts to that end. He put forth all his skill, showed himself sincere, adaptable, affectionate, devoted, even discreet. His heart taught him the delicacies of feeling. He said charming and touching things to the faithless one, and to soften her he told her all that he had suffered. Crossing the band of his trousers upon his stomach, See, said he, how thin I have got. He promised her everything he thought could gratify a woman, country parties, hats, jewels. Sometimes he thought she would take pity on him. She no longer displayed an insolently happy countenance. Being separated from Paul, her sadness had an air of gentleness, but the moment he made a gesture to recover her, she turned away fiercely and gloomily, girt with her fault as if with a golden girdle. He did not give up, making himself humble, suppliant, lamentable. One day he went to La Personne and said to him with tears in his eyes, Will you speak to her? La Personne excused himself, thinking that his intervention would be useless, but he gave some advice to his friend. Make her think that you don't care about her, that you love another, and she will come back to you. Hippolyta, adopting this method, inserted in the newspapers that he was always to be found in the company of Mademoiselle Guineau of the opera. He came home late or did not come home at all, assumed in Eveline's presence an appearance of inward joy impossible to restrain, took out of his pocket at dinner a letter on scented paper, which he pretended to read with delight, and his lips seemed as in a dream to kiss invisible lips. Nothing happened. Eveline did not even notice the change. Insensible to all around her, she only came out of her lethargy to ask for some louis from her husband, and if he did not give them, she threw him a look of contempt, ready to upbraid him with the shame which she poured upon him in the sight of the whole world. Since she had loved, she spent a great deal on dress. She needed money, and she had only her husband to secure it for her. She was so far faithful to him. He lost patience, became furious, and threatened her with his revolver. He said one day before her to Madame Clarence, I congratulate you, Madame. You have brought up your daughter to be a wanton hussy. Take me away, Mamma, exclaimed Eveline. I will get a divorce. He loved her more ardently than ever. In his jealous rage, suspecting her, not without probability, of sending and receiving letters, he swore that he would intercept them, re-established a censorship over the post, threw private correspondence into confusion, delayed stock exchange quotations, prevented assignations, brought about bankruptcies, thwarted passions, and caused suicides. 
The independent press gave utterance to the complaints of the public and indignantly supported them. To justify these arbitrary measures, the ministerial journals spoke darkly of plots and public dangers, and promoted a belief in a monarchical conspiracy. The less well-informed sheets gave more precise information, told of the seizure of 50,000 guns and the landing of Prince Crucho. Feeling grew throughout the country, and the Republican organs called for the immediate meeting of Parliament. Paul Visere returned to Paris, summoned his colleagues, held an important cabinet council, and proclaimed through his agencies that a plot had actually formed against the national representation, but that the Prime Minister held the threads of it in his hand, and that a judicial inquiry was about to be opened. He immediately ordered the arrest of thirty socialists, and whilst the entire country was acclaiming him as its savior, baffling the watchfulness of his six hundred detectives, he secretly took Eveline to a little house near the northern railway station, where they remained until night. After their departure, the maid of their hotel, as she was putting their room in order, saw seven little crosses traced by a hairpin on the wall at the head of the bed. That is all that Hippolytus Array obtained as a reward of his efforts. End of Book 7, Chapter 8 Chapter 9 the final consequences. Jealousy is a virtue of democracies which preserves them from tyrants. Deputies began to envy the Prime Minister his golden key. For a year his domination over the beauteous Madame Serret had been known to the whole universe. The provinces, whither news and fashions only arrive after a complete revolution of the earth round the sun, were at last informed of the illegitimate loves of the cabinet. The provinces preserve an austere morality. Women are more virtuous there than they are in the capital. Various reasons have been alleged for this. Education, example, simplicity of life. Professor Haddock asserts that this virtue of provincial ladies is solely due to the fact that the heels of their shoes are low. A woman, said he in a learned article in the Anthropological Review, a woman attracts a civilized man in proportion as her feet make an angle with the ground. If this angle is as much as thirty-five degrees, the attraction becomes acute, for the position of the feet upon the ground determines the whole carriage of the body, and it results that provincial women, since they wear low heels, are not very attractive, and preserve their virtue with ease. These conclusions were not generally accepted. It was objected under the influence of English and American fashions low heels had been introduced generally without producing the results attributed to them by the learned professor. Moreover, it was said that the difference he pretended to establish between the morals of the metropolis and those of the provinces is perhaps illusory, and that if it exists, it is apparently due to the fact that great cities offer more advantages and facilities for love than small towns provide. However that may be, the provinces began to murmur against the prime minister and to raise a scandal. This was not yet a danger, but there was a possibility that it might become one. For the moment the peril was nowhere and yet everywhere. The majority remained solid, but the leaders became stiff and exacting. Perhaps Hippolytus Serret would never have intentionally sacrificed his interests to his vengeance, but thinking that he could henceforth Without compromising his own fortune, secretly damaged that of Paul Visere, he devoted himself to the skillful and careful preparation of difficulties and perils for the head of the government. Though far from equaling his rival in talent, knowledge, and authority, he greatly surpassed him in his skill as a lobbyist. The most acute parliamentarians attributed the recent misfortunes of the majority to his refusal to vote. At committees, by a calculated imprudence, he favored motions which he knew the Prime Minister could not accept. One day his intentional awkwardness provoked a sudden and violent conflict between the Minister of the Interior and his departmental treasurer. Then Saray became frightened and went no further. It would have been dangerous for him to overthrow the Ministry too soon. His ingenious hatred found an issue by circuitous paths. Paul Visere had a poor cousin of easy morals who bore his name. Serret, remembering this lady, Céline Visere, brought her into prominence, arranged that she should become intimate with several foreigners, and procured her engagements in the music halls. One summer night, on a stage in the Champs-Élysées, before a tumultuous crowd, 
she performed risky dances to the sounds of wild music, which was audible in the gardens where the President of the Republic was entertaining royalty. The name of Visere, associated with these scandals, covered the walls of the town, filled the newspapers, was repeated in the cafés and at balls, and blazed forth in letters of fire upon the boulevards. Nobody regarded the Prime Minister as responsible for the scandal of his relatives, but a bad idea of his family came into existence, and the influence of the statesman was diminished. Almost immediately he was made to feel this in a pretty sharp fashion. One day in the house, on a simple question, La Billette, the Minister of Religion and Public Worship, who was suffering from an attack of liver and beginning to be exasperated by the intentions and intrigues of the clergy, threatened to close the chapel of St. Orborosia and spoke without respect of the National Virgin. The entire right rose up in indignation. The left appeared to give but a half-hearted support to the rash minister. The leaders of the majority did not care to attack a popular cult which brought thirty millions a year into the country. The most moderate of the supporters of the right, M. Bigor, made the question the subject of a resolution and endangered the cabinet. Luckily, Fortune La Person, the Minister of Public Works, always conscious of the obligations of power, was able in the Prime Minister's absence to repair the awkwardness and indecorum of his colleague, the Minister of Public Worship. He ascended the tribune and bore witness to the respect in which the government held the heavenly patron of the country, the consoler of so many ills which science admitted its powerlessness to relieve. When Paul Visere, snatched at last from Eveline's arms, appeared in the house, the administration was saved, but the Prime Minister saw himself compelled to grant important concessions to the upper classes. He proposed in Parliament that six armoured cruisers should be laid down, and thus won the sympathies of the Steel Trust. He gave new assurances that the income tax would not be imposed, and he had eighteen socialists arrested. He was soon to find himself opposed by more formidable obstacles. The Chancellor of the neighboring empire, in an ingenious and profound speech upon the foreign relations of his sovereign, made a sly allusion to the intrigues that inspired the policy of a great country. This reference, which was received with smiles by the imperial parliament, was certain to irritate a punctilious republic. It aroused the national susceptibility which directed its wrath against its amorous minister. The deputies seized upon a frivolous pretext to show their dissatisfaction. A ridiculous incident, the fact that the wife of a sub-prefect had danced at the Moulin Rouge, forced the minister to face a vote of censure, and he was within a few votes of being defeated. According to general opinion, Paul Visere had never been so weak, so vacillating, or so spiritless as on that occasion. He understood that he could only keep himself in office by a great political stroke, and he decided on the expedition to Negritia. This measure was demanded by the great financial and industrial corporations, and was one which would bring concessions of immense forests to the capitalists, a loan of eight millions to the banking companies, as well as promotions and decorations to the naval and military officers. A pretext presented itself. Some insult needed to be avenged or some debt to be collected. Six battleships, fourteen cruisers, and eighteen transports sailed up the mouth of the river Hippopotamus. Six hundred canoes vainly opposed the landing of the troops. Admiral Vivier de Moraine's cannons produced an appalling effect upon the blacks, who replied to them with flights of arrows, but in spite of their fanatical courage they were entirely defeated. Popular enthusiasm was kindled by the newspapers, which the financiers subsidized, and burst into a blaze. Some socialists alone protested against this barbarous, doubtful, and dangerous enterprise. They were at once arrested. At that moment when the minister, supported by wealth, and now beloved by the poor, seemed unconquerable, the light of hate showed Hippolyta Serre alone the danger, and looking with a gloomy joy at his rival, he muttered between his teeth, He is wrecked, the brigand. Whilst the country intoxicated itself with glory, the neighboring empire protested against the occupation of Negritia by a European power, and these protests, following one another at shorter and shorter intervals, became more and more vehement. The newspapers of the interested republic concealed all causes for uneasiness, but Hippolytus Serre heard the growing menace and determined at last to risk everything, even the fate of the ministry, in order to ruin his enemy. He got men whom he could trust to write and insert articles in several of the official journals, 
which, seeming to express Paul Visere's precise views, attributed warlike intentions to the head of the government. These articles roused a terrible echo abroad, and they alarmed the public opinion of a nation which, while fond of soldiers, was not fond of war. Questioned in the House on the foreign policy of his government, Paul Visere made a reassuring statement, and promised to maintain a face compatible with the dignity of a great nation. His minister of foreign affairs, Cromville, read a declaration which was absolutely unintelligible, for the reason that it was couched in diplomatic language. The minister obtained a large majority. But the rumors of war did not cease, and in order to avoid a new and dangerous motion, the prime minister distributed 80,000 acres of forests in Agricia among the deputies, and had 14 socialists arrested. Hippolyta Serey went gloomily about the lobbies, confiding to the deputies of his group that he was endeavoring to induce the cabinet to adopt a pacific policy, and that he still hoped to succeed. Day by day the sinister rumors grew in volume, and penetrating amongst the public spread uneasiness and disquiet. Paul Visere himself began to take alarm. What disturbed him most were the silence and absence of the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Crumbeil no longer came to the meetings of the cabinet. Rising at five o'clock in the morning, he worked eighteen hours at his desk, and at last fell exhausted into his waste-paper basket, from whence the registrars removed him, together with the papers which they were going to sell, to the military attachés of the neighboring empire. General Debonair believed that a campaign was imminent, and prepared for it. Far from fearing war, he prayed for it, and confided his generous hopes to Baroness Bilderman, who informed the neighboring nation, which acting on her information proceeded to a rapid mobilization. The Minister of Finance unintentionally precipitated events. At the moment he was speculating for a fall, and in order to bring about a panic on the stock exchange, he spread the rumor that war was now inevitable. The neighboring empire, deceived by this action, and expecting to see its territory invaded, mobilized its troops in all haste. The terrified chamber overthrew the Visere ministry by an enormous majority, 814 votes to seven, with 28 abstentions. It was too late. The very day of this fall, the neighboring and hostile nation recalled its ambassador and flung eight millions of men into Madame Serret's country. War became universal, and the whole world was drowned in a torrent of blood. The Zenith of Penguin Civilization Half a century after the events we have just related, Madame Serret died surrounded with respect and veneration in the eighty-ninth year of her age. She had long been the widow of a statesman whose name she bore with dignity. Her modest and quiet funeral was followed by the orphans of the parish and the sisters of the sacred compassion. The deceased left all her property to the charity of St. Orberosia. Alas, sighed M. Monoyer, a canon of St. Mail, as he received the pious legacy, it was high time for a generous benefactor to come to the relief of our necessities. Rich and poor, learned and ignorant, are turning away from us. And when we try to lead back these misguided souls, neither threats nor promises, neither gentleness nor violence, nor anything else is now successful. The penguin clergy pine in desolation. Our country priests, reduced to following the humblest of trades, are shoeless and compelled to live upon such scraps as they can pick up. In our ruined churches the rain of heaven falls upon the faithful, and during the holy offices they can hear the noise of stones falling from the arches. The tower of the cathedral is tottering and will soon fall. St. Orberosia is forgotten by the penguins her devotion abandoned and her sanctuary deserted. On her shrine, bereft of its gold and precious stones, the spider silently weaves her web. Hearing these lamentations, Pierre Mille, who at the age of ninety-eight years had lost nothing of his intellectual and moral power, asked the canon if he did not think that St. Orberosia would one day rise out of this wrongful oblivion. I hardly dare to hope so, sighed Monsieur Monoyer. It is a pity answered Pierre Mille. Orberosia is a charming figure, and her legend is a beautiful one. I discovered the other day, by the merest chance, one of her most delightful miracles, the miracle of Jean Viol. Would you like to hear it, Monsieur Monoy? I should be very pleased, Monsieur Mille. Here it is, then, just as I found it in a fifteenth-century manuscript. Cécile, the wife of Nicolas Gobert, a jeweler on the Pont-au-Change, 
Uh, after having led an honest and chaste life for many years, and being now past her prime, became infatuated with Jean Viol, the Countess de Maubec's page, who lived at the Hotel de Paon in the Place de Grave. He was not yet eighteen years old, and his face and figure were attractive. Not being able to conquer her passion, Cecile resolved to satisfy it. She attracted the page to her house, loaded him with caresses, supplied him with sweetmeats, and finally did as she wished with him. Now one day, as they were together in the jeweler's bed, Master Nicholas came home sooner than he was expected. He found the bolt drawn, and heard his wife on the other side of the door exclaiming, My heart, my angel, my love! Then suspecting that she was shut up with a gallant, he struck great blows upon the door, and began to shout, Slut, hussy, wanton, open so that I may cut off your nose and ears! In, the, in this peril, the jeweler's wife besought St. Orborosia, and vowed her a large candle if she helped her, and the little page, who was dying of fear beside the bed, out of their difficulty. The saint heard the prayer. She immediately changed Jean Viol into a girl. Seeing this, Cécile was completely reassured, and began to call out to her husband, Oh, you brute, villain, you jealous wretch! Speak gently if you want the door to be opened. And, scolding in this way, she ran to the wardrobe and took out of it an old hood, a pair of stays, a long grey petticoat, in which she hastily wrapped the transformed page. Then when this was done, Catherine, dear Catherine, said she loudly, open the door for your uncle. He is more fool than knave and won't do you any harm. The boy, who had become a girl, obeyed. Master Nicholas entered the room and found in it a young maid whom he did not know and his wife in bed. Big booby, said the latter to him, don't stand gaping at what you see. Just as I had come to bed because I had a stomach ache, I received a visit from Catherine. Uh, the daughter of my sister, Jean de Palissieux, uh, with whom we quarrelled fifteen years ago? Kiss your niece, she is well worth the trouble. Uh, the jeweller gave a viol a hug, and from that moment wanted nothing so much as to be alone with her a moment, so that he might embrace her as much as he liked. For this reason he led her without any delay down to the kitchen, upon the pretext of giving her some walnuts and wine, and he was no sooner there with her than he began to caress her very affectionately. He would not have stopped at that if St. Orborosia had not inspired his good wife with the idea of seeing what he was about. She found him with the pretended niece sitting on his knee. She called him a debauched creature, boxed his ears, and forced him to beg her pardon. The next day, Viol resumed his previous form. Having heard this story, the venerable canon Monnier thanked Pierre Mille for having told it, and taking up his pen began to write out a list of horses that would win at the next race meeting for he was a bookmaker's clerk. In the meantime, Penguinia gloried in its wealth. Those who produced the things necessary for life wanted them. Those who did not produce them had more than enough. But these, as a member of the Institute said, are necessary economic fatalities. The great penguin people had no longer either traditions, intellectual culture, or arts. The progress of civilization manifested itself among them by murderous industry, infamous speculation, and hideous luxury. Its capital assumed, as did all the great cities of the time, a cosmopolitan and financial character. An immense and regular ugliness reigned within it. The country enjoyed perfect tranquility. It had reached its zenith. End of chapter 9 and the end of book 7